Hello. Okay, let's start. Welcome to Drupal Camp Vienna, day two. Um, I just want to say um, a couple of words before we start with the keyword, keynote. Um, thank you for showing up uh, after the party yesterday. Uh, we appreciate it. And um, I just have to remind you uh, to wear your badges and show it for the coffee guys. Otherwise, you will get no coffee. And I think we all need it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, our keynote today is about um, typography. Typography is a very important thing. I think every professional in the IT should know at least the basics about it. And we are very proud to have a, a speaker, um, Marco Tukonczyk. He's um, a writer, designer, and also you are doing, you have written a chapter for the Smashing book, right? And uh, yeah, just hand over the micro to him. Please welcome Marco. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Um, so if you don't wear badges, no coffee. That's the most important thing. This is what I heard. Uh, yeah, thanks again for showing up because it's Saturday morning and I know how parties in, 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 in Austria can be because you have all this Red Bull and everything, so people just, uh, you know, you have these ups and downs. Um, anyway, uh, I haven't attended the party because uh, I'm pretty much old by now and <laughs> I had my fair share of, uh, you know, Red Bull vodkas back in the days. Um, so I'll talk about uh, typography and I'll try to entertain you a little bit because this is supposed to be a keynote whatever thing. Um, and usually when they, uh, they announce me as a keynote speaker, I say, yeah, I, I use keynote, not PowerPoint. So that's, you know, that's about it. Um, so anyway, um, I have Twitter account like many of you do. So if you have any problem, of, of, I mean typographic problem, after the conference, you can at reply me and I'll be happy to help. Uh, also, um, this is a little longer presentation than I usually uh, give, so it will last about 45, 50 minutes. Um, so you can find different parts of this presentation in, uh, on this link. Um, there's a lot of other presentations and people usually want my presentations not because I'm so great, but because I have plenty of CSS snippets, so you don't have to kind of write them down right away. Uh, you, can, you can just copy and paste them from the presentation. That's why uh, the, pre the slides are for. Um, if you read my bio, uh, that's great. If you haven't, I built Type Tester in 2005. How many of you use Type Tester in, in your life? Not so many? All right, that's nice. Uh, anyway, it, it was there for, uh, since 2005 and it was the first tool to compare uh, typefaces on the web. We had like plenty of settings so you can compare um, different settings uh, across uh, three columns and then it will uh, generate CSS that you can copy and paste uh, into your project. Uh, I also run a small UX consultancy, Create Unites. We usually work with big corporate clients and we try to convince them that they should uh, uh, treat their uh, users fairly. Uh, we, we are trying to uh, you know, match their business goals with users' needs so they then actually uh, steal from their customers. Uh, we're still, still not there, but you know, step by step. Um, also, I wrote, I contributed in Smash Book number four with my chapter on web typography. And I'm also one of the editors in Smash Magazine, so if you have an idea for an article, uh, just find me later, uh, I'll stick around and, and we can discuss it. And after this series of commercials, uh, you can see uh, I'm pretty busy, but I also have a life. This is my picture from, from my vacation. No, no, this, this was my wife, sorry. So this is mine. Uh, and I don't know how many of you have been to Croatia. Have you visited the Croatian coast? All right, thank you so much for sending money in my country. This really, perfect, all right. Uh, so this, was, this one was taken uh, on the last day uh, of our 
vacation before we had to go back uh, to, our, to, uh, to school. And you can see the difference in the expression between my wife and me and the guys over there. They are like, oh, no. Uh, but that's not at all important uh, as much as this guy is important because he started playing online curling games when he was five. And because everyone in the kindergarten wanted to play games and they told him that, uh, that you know, he can play games online, I'm some, I somehow tricked him that these are the, the games that all the other ch children are playing. And he was like so much into it that you can see, you know, he's really like winning when when uh, when he uh, puts the, the the current pairs together. And um, so when he was nine, we participated in a school in the local elementary workshop, and we uh, I ran a workshop on topography, and this is how he uh, spelled his name, using as little ink as possible to create as big letters as possible. So this is called invert type. Um, and then uh, a couple of years later, he came up with this idea how to create a logotype for a museum, uh, combining his, his two loves, uh, Lego bricks and topography by, by then <laughs> already. So muse means museum in creation, and you can clearly see uh, the connection. So when he brought it to me, like self-initiated, I was like, oh my god. Yeah. Uh, and what can I say? Font is strong in my family. <laughs> and then, you know, like every other person with this illness called an eye for typography, I too go crazy when you see an arrangement like this. And this is a field trip bus. And I can understand comic science here because it's supposed to be fun when you're going on a trip. I can understand this jumping dot, you know, and everything's like slanted there because it's dynamic and you'll get there fast and everything. But you know, I really can't understand what's this dot for. I mean, <laughs> should you take a pause before you dial this number? <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah, it's, I mean, may, maybe the designer was an asshole, so, you know. Um, anyway, so after years of, of learning uh, about the topography on my own, uh, yeah, all right. Uh, after years of learning about topography on my own, I finally went to Reading. Reading in the UK uh, is, has a really great school for type design. And I met really great people. This is me, of course, the only guy with, with coffee. Um, and they have like a huge library of old books, like from whatever, you know, uh, 12th centuries, 13th centuries, mostly Bibles uh, from that time. Uh, but also they have this Pantographia, which is a collection of all known scripts in the world. And they built, they built, not built, they, they, they printed this book because we build stuff, right? They print stuff. Uh, they uh, print this book so that they can uh, spread Christianity more easily across the world, right? Um, so I learned that UTF is actually nothing new. So they had it in, you know, 16th century. So in a way, we web developers, web designers reinvent the wheel. And this whole talk will basically be about translating what's already existing in, in print design world to, to web design with, with some help of CSS. Another thing that I learned is that they, they too had like mobile versions of, of, the, of books. Because uh, in the 16th century, when they started printing books, it was not actually allowed to read anything else than the Bible. I know, horrible. So they had to print books in this uh, really small format so that you can hide them in your coat or you know, under skirt or whatever, uh, so that you're not burned as a witch because you read something that's not Bible. Um, this is even smaller than 16 pixels on my, uh, on my iPhone. And I, I just realized that I have a red cover and so please don't judge me. All right. Um, all right. So regardless if you are just a developer and not a designer or you know, information architect or UX designer or graphic designer or what, whoever, I think it's very important to know some basics uh, on typography because you know, we all work with text, with images, with layouts. The final product of our work is always something that the user can read. All right. So uh, let me make an analogy. You, in, in music, you have people who build instruments, right? They can build a violin or a piano. And then you have other, other group of people who compose music, like Mozart or Beethoven or 
uh, all these uh, great guys. And then you have performers, which are you know, people who play music. So they don't compose, they don't build the instruments, but they can really play music. So I want to make a little experiment. So make some room around you. And if you can repeat after me. So stomp with, with your right leg. Left and clap. Okay, perfect. Uh, once again. What song is that? What song is that? Great. So actually, we can play music. So no reason not to try with a little typography, right? You get my point? No excuse. All right, so what do we have uh, for you today? We have some preparation, how to prepare the document, how to select the typeface. Uh, there are not so many rules as much as things to avoid. Uh, then about the paragraph, because the paragraph is the fundamental unit in typography, how to create text hierarchy, by that I mean subheads, captions, etc., etc. how to design for, for tables, and finally I'll cover uh, responsive typography. And I had a glass of gas water, which I really, really uh, don't like. So, uh. anyway, as you know, uh, we have the premiere of Star Wars Seven. How many of you already bought a ticket? Very nice, good people, smart people. Anyway, uh, like in in Star Wars uh, saga, they always, you know fought wars and there will never be peace. So the same thing is with browsers. Even though now we have this Edge, MS Edge browser that, uh, you know, that, that, that is kind of updated to, to meet the, the certain criteria that Firefox and Chrome has, now we have Safari on Mac, which is like, oh my god, you know, he's now the ugly child in the room. Um, nobody wants to, to play with him. Uh, so the thing is that my preferred method is actually to reset everything because other methods which are using a framework brings an overhead and that ruins your performance. Another method is to, uh, uh, to um, let the browser decide how to render certain elements, then you override them. Everything else but resetting everything basically brings some overhead later on and will complicate things. So uh, this is my preferred method to just reset everything and it might seem, seem like um, you know, doing things uh, twice, but it's actually not, because when you do this, you actually have to uh, style every element, and then you, you're in full control of your topography and your layout. The next thing that I want to tweak a little is reduce contrast, because as you know, in print, light falls to the medium and then reflects back into your eye, right? And on the screen, the, the light comes from the, from the medium itself. So black doesn't have to be black, right? And white doesn't have to be completely white. So why not combining uh, you know, slightly uh, grayish text on, on black background and dark gray text on white background? And I'll show you why. So can you tell the difference between this and this? Of course you can. But you know, first time around, this might as well seem like black on white or white or black, right? So if you just tweak, tweak it a little bit, you can actually uh, release some strain from, from the user when they're watching um, your text. Okay, next thing, selecting the typeface. Again, nothing too smart here, just some things to avoid, for instance. I know, right? I mean, take a look at this. <laughs> and where's punctuation here? You know? So apart from, from using Comic Sans for something that serious, right? The, the whole typesetting altogether is, uh, is just messed up. Uh, so you know, the first thing that you want to do is just spell the sentence correctly. Don't use double space, don't use triple space, don't use a justified text because th this will create uh, some you know weird holes here, uh, and definitely don't use Comic Sans for for this kind of stuff. Um, probably the most important thing when selecting a typeface is 
will the typeface support all the characters for your audience on the website. And since, since we were building websites and not printing materials, so you know, people can uh, probably log in into your system. They have different usernames with on, you know, in different scripts or in different languages. For instance, my last name has one weird uh, character with a diacritic. Uh, so if, if uh, your um, typeface doesn't support all the characters that your u users are using, which is basically the whole world, um, and then that's not a good typeface. So that's, that's rule number one. And then when you, when you, you know, look at the typeface, if kerning pairs are not done correctly, then uh, later on you'll have these weird combinations. So since you came to typography for developers, I want to equip you with some tricks how to kern typefaces properly. And even, even graphic designers, not all graphic designers know about this trick. So we have something here. We have some gaps. Like this one is not proper. This one is a little off. This one's too close. Um, the basic thing when, when doing kerning, when, when, kerning uh, when you want to kern uh, words, is to leave the first char character and the last character where they are. So you just move everything in between, right? So since it's very uh, difficult to judge glyphs when you already know the word, there's a simple trick. You just flip it, and now you don't understand uh, the word immediately, right? So I'll give you about 10 seconds to try to kern this, right? Just try to have an idea what's happening here. So how would you move stuff around? All right, so anyone has an idea? What's the first thing that you want to do? All right, perfect. What else? See where? There or there? To the right. Okay. Here and here. All right. And what else? All right. So let me help you a little bit. Uh, even though kerning is is um, an attribute of of a pair of letters, you always observe them in triples, right? So you observe this pair, this group, and then this group, and then this group, and then this group, and then this group, this group, and you know you finally get this sorted out. So if you just want to move V towards A, that's actually breaking the rest of the world uh, the, uh, of the word. So the first thing I would do is move the C to the right, and then this gap is uh, is much Closed, much cl more closed than this one. So I have to move the I to the right as well. Because now we're closing this gap, I can move the N here. So then I close the gap with the O, right? I don't have to move O anywhere. And then when I, when I observe this triple, I just can move the V over there. And then when I observe this one, then I adjust I. So if you go you know, free by free by free, you actually can kern letters uh, very easily. So I'll give you another example. Do you have an idea here? All right, so you move O a little bit here, then V to here, and you'll get it uh, about right. And if you're so much into, into typography by now, because I can see your burning desire to kern type, uh, go to this link and play kerning games. And I'm sure you'll manage to avoid this kind of fails. Please don't let that happen to you. I mean, not the action, the, this design. All right. All right, so the next thing is people very frequently ask me whether they should you know, use serif or sans serif. And we used to avoid serifs because we had like really low resolution screens that couldn't uh, render all the tiny details in, in glyphs. But nowadays, when, when you know, the screens are getting better, there's no technical reason to use, to prefer one over another. 
especially now that uh, the biggest support was like the New York Times or Le Monde use uh, serif typeface at 16 pixel. But sometimes when you have a project uh, and you see what, what's happening you know, on the page, you can cut corners. So for instance, if you have a lot of tabular data and you want to compare stuff vertically, then it doesn't make sense to use a serif because serif add horizontal stress. And then if you have something that, that's uh, more of a linear information, then of course you can use serifs because they add to the horizontal, uh, to the horizontal flow. Especially if you want to set type, if you want to put a lot of information on, uh, on a small, uh, in a small area, then it's good to use service because it's much easier to, s to read lines if they have some kind of baseline um, visually. Uh, sometimes it's good to just you know, take a step back and see what's happening on the layout. So for instance, when they redesigned Smash Magazine, Elio J. Stocks and Whitley Friedman actually observed what's happening with, with advertisement, with, with the navigation, with the overall layout. And because everything was so busy on the website, they decided that they, they, will, they will go with uh, sans serif because that's much simpler and easier to read in this kind of environment. But then again, if you just uh, build uh, articles for a news portal without many ads, which I hope you do sometimes, um, you can just use the serve because it's, uh, again, easier for, for linear reading. So paragraphs. Paragraphs are super important. Uh, I don't know if you read this, this quote because it's on the internet like since, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, no wonder if you already stumbled upon it. Um, it's from Robert Brinker's book, The Elements of Typographic Style. Now I think it's like in fourth version but he actually uh, released like 1.1, 1.2. So now it's, it's at about 4.0 something, uh, maybe even more. Um, the thing is that there is an ideal line length and then according to that you should uh, adjust everything else inside the paragraph. So there are other spaces like letter space, word space and line space. And whenever you change one, you should probably re reassess the other two, because they are interdependent. And as you can see, the line space is the biggest, word space is uh, in between, and letter space is the smallest. So the, the, the smaller the, the space is, the more things you can mess up if you don't, do, if you don't know what you do. That's why a web designer usually just uh, adjust line space or line height in CSS language, because that's, uh, that's the safest thing to, to tweak. If you mess up letter space, this will really uh, look awkward. B but you know, anyway, that shouldn't stop you uh, from experimenting a little and you know, seeing what's happening there. The problem that we are facing right now is that sometimes we cannot fit the ideal line length uh, 45, be uh, between 45 and 75 characters in line because we have mobile screens which can barely fit 40. So that's you know much much uh, narrower than than uh, the rest of the of the of the screens. Uh, so again, if we know that we can adjust proportions, as you can see, the the word space is here much smaller than this one. The line height is much uh, lower than than this one, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So there are ways to there are actually mathematical formulas to help you with that. Um, another thing is whenever you leave. Uh, uh, loosely spaced text that you spaced for the desktop screen and you just squished it and display the same line height on mobile, you get the effect of your text looking like a list. Whenever that happens, whenever you kind of squint and see that you have uh, the list of links instead of, uh, the list of, of, of lines instead of the paragraph, then you should probably make it a little tighter. Again, how tight is too tight? Just print a couple of Qs, a couple of Ds in your keyboard, and if the uh, this center and A center touch inappropriately, uh, then that's probably too much. Again, you can go and test umlauts or diacritics to see if they touch, because they should be separate. Again, this is a formula. Uh, Everything is basic math, so there's nothing creative about setting paragraph, you just use some rules 
And in this tool, universaltopography.com slash demo, uh, you can use the sliders to adjust some settings. And whenever you're like off, way off, it will just turn red. So this is a really cool tool to just practice how to set paragraphs. And then you know you can resize a window or whatever, and or, or the column and see you know what's the appropriate proportion on a mobile screen. Very cool tool. Okay, text hierarchy. So how to how to uh, design that? How to develop that? Uh, if you only have one headline and you know three or four paragraphs in an article, then it doesn't make sense to have uh, the text set at 16 pixels and, every, uh, and, and the headline in you know 72 or something like that because it will look disproportional. But then if you have a lot of subheads in a longer article, then it makes sense to increase the, the size for the subheads. So for that, again, we have typographic scale, something that people invented in 16th century. And we are so, so accustomed to it by now because we are using it for 400 years. I don't know if you're aware we are actually using the same sizing in books and magazines uh, for 400 years, uh, that it's really, there's no real reason to reinvent the wheel and you know, introduce your own sizing, because you know, this just works. Uh, by the way, these are the uh, sizes that you see in the Photoshop drop-down menu for font sizing. That's why, because that's, that's the basic typographic scale. And then if you're comfortable with it, and it doesn't suit your needs, you can devise your own. For instance, this one is based on 1.5 uh, increments, so everything is 150% uh, bigger. And then if that's not good enough, you can visit modularscale.com, uh, a tool for creating scales that are based on musical scales. So ev again, everything is very natural, very proportional. And you don't have to use uh, the values here only for the titles uh, or, or subheads. You can also use them for white space. You can use them for image proportions. You can use them for column proportions and stuff like that. And everything will basically look very harmonic in your design. Again, nothing creative about the property. Just use things that are already invented, that are already proven to work, right? And then again, with all these scales, because there's about 20 different scales, musical scales there, you can actually create something that is unique. It doesn't have to look as your neighbor's website. But again, it doesn't have to be creative, right? So use, use these kind of tools. Also, setting subheads in CSS, an article that I wrote for, for Typekit blog, um, there's about 20 different ways to style subheads with lines, with, with outdents, with different positioning. Uh, I really use uh, progress enhancements where, whenever I can, so everything should work without changing H HTML dr uh, dramatically. Go there, visit this, web, uh, this link, and you'll get plenty of examples there. The next thing that I like to talk about with developers is data tables, because when you start developing something, it's usually an admin interface, because you know, you're waiting for the design or something like that. And you want to prepare your database, you want to do your taxonomy, you want to check your content types. This one is obviously from, from WordPress. But you know, whenever developers start doing, uh, you know, developing an admin interface, they basically need a list of entities. They need checkboxes, select all, select none, delete, change, edit, whatever. It's always tables. Basically, you know, developers are rebuilding Gmail interface over and over and over again. So uh, the thing is, with tables, um, even though data is structured and we have a grid, it doesn't have to be grid-like. So when you look at it, it, you know, every piece of information is basically isolated in a cage. So the first thing we want to do is just remove the bores and, and remove cell, cell padding and cell spacing so that the you know, data can actually breed. Uh, you can leave the horizontal lines because they actually add to legibility and you can you know, easily see the difference between uh, you know, these two piece of pieces of information, you know that they are not together. Because if you just remove the line, then it kind of, you close the door for the possibility to have a paragraph here. Because if you have a, two paragraphs in one cell without the bore and then a paragraph in the next cell, it will look like three paragraphs in one cell, right? So if you use a bore, you clear, clearly say, all right, this piece of information belongs to, to, to one row and this piece of information belongs to, to the next row. Another great thing is that not many people still 
know about is vertical align top. Always use that because if you have different pieces of information, you want actually the reader to just continue reading, not to skip and try to find, navigate the beginning of the next cell. So vertical align top for that. And then again, this is the default display. And HTML is not supposed to be smart about styling, right? So HTML doesn't know if you have numeric data, but the reader cannot read it because they cannot compare it. You always want to align uh, singles under singles, tens under tens, hundreds under hundreds, et cetera, et cetera, so the people can actually uh, you know, better compare the data. That's why you have tables, because tables are very useful co for comparing data. And you, that, you do that by you know, specifying class number or something like that to your table cell and then aligning everything to the right. And that actually creates a very legible uh, data table. All that with only this piece of CSS, right? So nothing complicated. Um, do you know about this property? Who knows about table layout? Come on, don't be shy. All right, some smart people here. Uh, table layout fixed, especially, will retain the table uh, uh, dimensions will, uh, contained. So whenever you have something long, like like a URL or something that won't break into another row, that won't wrap, uh, that can break your your layout because the cell just expands, right? But if you say table layout fixed, it will just keep it retain its dimensions, and um, the the link will just be cut off. It's kind of overflow hidden just for tables. You know overflow hidden that we use for IE, all right? So this is a very cool thing. Um, again, if you're using padding, uh, try to kind of uh, make it harmonic. So one point, uh, 0 0.1 plus 0 0.74 equals 75. So you get the same step between the rows, right? So these are little details that you can actually tweak to make the table look really, really cool and usable. All right, so now that you know all the basic stuff, if you are super hungry, you can go because now I'm just applying everything to responsive topography. And why it's complicated? Because we have all these different you know, conditions. So my um, guideline, it's not a rule, it's a guideline, number one is to use different font sizes for different reading distances. And that's, you know, that's common sense, of course, but how do you detect the reading distance? So right now, we are detecting it by, by uh, assuming the, the uh, device's form factor. So we uh, test with media queries for the, f for the screen size. But as you know, you can have TV that's, that has lower resolution than your smartphone, or you can use your tablet on the kitchen countertop while you're doing you know, uh, some cooking, or you're reading the recipe. So you want your type to be bigger. So Right now, we cannot know how the device is used, right? <coughs> so that's why I experimented with the response topography uh, demo, the using web RTC technology. Basically, um, I use the um, the face recognition thing here by Matthias uh, Eugen, um, Oden Matthias Eugen, sorry, from Opera. Uh, this guy is super clever. Nobody knows about him except me, probably. Uh, he builds all this kind of uh, stuff uh, with JavaScript. Uh, so basically, you have to uh, say, yes, you can use my camera. And then it, it detects your face. And depending on, your, on the distance from the screen, it can increase or decrease uh, font size. I must say this is useless, because uh, nowadays you have to actually enable camera each time you visit the website. So that's very good for privacy, and I respect that, but it's, you know, it's not good for responsive design. So until they figure out the way to you know, make this actually uh, work and that we can start using it, uh, it's just an idea. Until then, you can use sizecalc.com. You can enter some values here, like the you know, assume distance from, from the screen, and then it will throw out the uh, the uh, the font size that you can use for 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 that um, for that reading distance uh, is still empirical, but you know this will give you an idea how big the font size should be. Again, nothing creative, nothing creative. Use this tool; it's, you, it will calculate the font size for you. Put it into your CSS, 
and you get actually the perfect letter size. You don't have to kind of decide it. Okay, uh, so guideline number two is maintain perfect proportions in a prior. Again, thing that I spoke earlier, but it's very important. Reduce line height, increase line height. Reduce uh, word spacing, increase word spacing. So every time for every breakpoint, you probably want to reassess the paragraph. You want to reset it altogether. Uh, use universalstepworthy.com slash demo website to help you with that, and you'll be, uh, you'll be good. Establish hierarchy. Again, establishing hierarchy with modular scale is easy. But what you can do on mobile screens, because you don't want to have like huge headlines on mobile and small, small, small text, uh, because the, the huge headline will probably push the text, the main text, down the fold. So on small screens, you can use all caps for, for H2, small caps for H3, and italic for H4. All are the same letter size. So if you have everything set in 16 pixels, but something is all caps, then obvious, it's obvious that that's very important. If something is small caps, that's a little less important. Italic is even less important. And if you combine this with bolts, you have about six style options, all at the same letter size. You don't have to increase the letter size, which is very useful for mobile screens, obviously, uh, because you have to save space. Again, in the end, paragraphs versus block paragraphs. How many of you know what's a block paragraph? All right, three, four, five, <coughs> cool. So this is a block paragraph. This is the default that we get with the browser, right? And since, again, mobile screens are so small and you want to put as much information as you can on the first screen, you can just use indented paragraphs. Block paragraphs are useful on, on multi-column layouts because they have to compete with the sidebar. They have to compete with the header, with footer, with, with ads or something like that that you have, uh, you know, uh, on the side of, of the main text. But on mobile screen, you don't have anything. You know? It's just text. When you scroll it, you don't get anything else there. Right? It, it's very linear. So actually, you can save space by just indenting uh, paragraphs. If you combine it with the previous rule, you get a nice cheat sheet. So use style variations. All caps, small caps, italics are the same letter size. Or use typographic scale. Use indented paragraphs or block cap paragraphs. Use white space to separate sections. And on desktop screens, on desktop resolutions, you can use uh, graphic elements like lines, colors, or texture, like gradients or whatever. Very easy when you, when you, uh, when you put it that way. I would feel really sorry if I haven't meant to mention this in, in, the, in the presentation, because I also believe that you're pretty much by now capable of, of doing something more than just you know, setting uh, basic uh, typography. So CSS shapes, do you know them? How many of you tried something with CSS shapes? All right, quite a few of you, great. Uh, very, very cool technology. Again, why I'm saying this uh, at this very moment is because, again, you can use media queries. So you can use CSS shapes for, uh, for desktop screens or whatever you have a lot of space that you can create something creative. And then you can just simply fall back to linear display on mobile screens. That's the beauty of combining media queries with all these advanced uh, features. Use graded fonts to normalize rendering. And I don't, well, that's, this is probably something new. Uh, so you have font grades. Font grades are actually not font weights. So this one here is not bold. It's just heavier grade of a typeface. And what's the difference between uh, weights and grades? Well, grades are so supple that they actually don't change the offset. So you can see the anatomy of, of the sentence is exactly the same. It won't change your offset. It will, it will occupy the same space, right? So you can use, uh, they, use it, they use it before in prints, again, something from the print world, to compensate for different ink qualities and, and paper qualities. And now we can use it to compensate for different pixel densities. So you can use. Um, very light grays for low resolution screens, and you can use heavy grays for, for high resolution screens, because high resolution screens obviously can render all these supple differences, and they can actually display the differences in stroke and all these you know, tiny little details in glyphs that the low resolution screens cannot, right? Because if you have a low resolution screen and something is very, very thin, 
it will, uh, it will anyway occupy the full pixel because you cannot use just the quarter of the pixel or fifth of the pixel. But if you have something that's high resolution, it can actually use much more pixels to render the shape. Another cool thing is, I don't know if you, have a, uh, if you ever thought about it, uh, but the sub-pixels are in horizontal uh, direction, right? And when you, s when you use your, your smartphone, that's everything's fine, right? Because um, the sub-pixels help with uh, sub-pixel anti-aliasing, right? But when you change the orientation, the sub-pixels actually are in, in vertical position. So all the, all the fonts that are optimized for sub-pixel anti-aliasing actually are not anti-aliased when you change the orientation of the screen. And then again, you can use grades because grades will help you with different uh, these subtle differences uh, to compensate for for uh, for this kind of uh, behavior. Um, take advantage of multiple optical sizes. What are optical sizes? So this is an optical size for reading, and you can see that by very low contrast. So the difference between tins and ticks is not as big as here. So when you uh, resize this down to, especially this one, which is bent from modern, when you resize it to 12 pixels, it will render even better than Verdana. So because it's optimized, you have this uh, really open contrast here. Uh, the contrast is low, and the X height, or the height of the letter X, is very big compared to this one. So you see the, the difference is much bigger in a display typeface. Uh, the contrast is much higher and the centers are much lower than here. Uh, because when you, when you optically see uh, a, a, a letter at, say, 12 pixels, this one will actually lose a lot of it, its detail because, uh, uh, especially on a lower resolution screen, you cannot render all these hairline details, all this you know, delicate stuff. But this font will actually endure, right? So whenever you have to, to display something on a really small size, like a small print, or for instance, uh, um, some notification in your field, like explanation of the form or something like that, you can actually use something that's optimized for, for small sizes. And this is called optical size. Uh, you can use font width according to the width of the screen. Here's an example. Take a look at this title. You can see that uh, the typeface gets wider. And we're also changing this intro here. All right, so cool thing about web fonts and, uh, and CSS is that the web font is actually not loaded, even though you specified it in CSS. You, you use add fonts face rule to, to specify the path to the font. But it's not loader uh, uh, until you use that family in your CSS. So of course, for this example, uh, all the fonts were loaded because I had to resize the window. But in, in regular use, when people don't you know, want to check the responsive design in all its glory, they will just get one breakpoint. So you just load the fonts that you need for that breakpoint. You don't load everything. So load your fonts inside the media query. And they will actually get just the font that they need for this breakpoint. Again, you don't have to do it manually. Font2wit.com, it's, it's, it's a tiny JavaScript that will actually decide when it's time to you know, load um, different font width. So these are three different fonts. But the JavaScript detects you, you, pu you put an array of, of desired fonts. And then the JavaScript detects whether it can fit a certain version. And then it loads just that version. There's one cool thing not many people know. Georgia and Verdana actually have their sisters, Georgia Pro and Verdana Pro, which are a little more condensed, as you can see. And if you still want to use Verdana and Georgia for the majority of, of, of visitors, like for instance, if you have a lot of visitors in IE or other, or other older browsers, but you still want to enhance typography for mobile visitors, then you can use Georgia and Verdana because they are a little uh, more condensed, so you can fit more characters uh, on the screen, on mobile screen. And then, you know, you can fall back to regular Georgian Verdana. That's a really, really cool thing. Um, and the last thing is, we have to embrace, not we, 
because you know majority of you are developers uh, but you know uh, it's still very important to advocate for the performance it's super super important you probably know that the, the importance uh, the, the performance of the database the performance of the queries but as well the the, the front-end performance how much assets do you load do you actually need them uh, latency all that all these issues are, are super important nowadays especially especially because I don't know if you're aware of that but Google will start to penalize websites that are slow in the same way that you have now the mobile friendly uh, tag near the website when the website is actually responsive in Google search results the next thing will be this website is fast all right so it will penalize slow websites. Some people actually get that feature already uh, in the testing phase. And there are a lot of uh, performance strategies, a lot of things you can do. Uh, maybe you don't agree with some of these. Uh, we can dis discuss that later. But again, the best thing you, that you can do is serve the content to the user as soon as possible. By that I mean, don't wait for the, for the web phone to load because this is, uh, this effect is called flush of unstyled text. And actually the HTML is there, but you load, you wait for, for the phone to load, and until it's loaded, the user cannot access the information. And that's not the most important thing, right? The most important thing is to get the information as soon as possible and not to get the information in a font the designer or you decided to use. So always provide fallback options. Everything about web performance is well written in, in the chapter on web performance uh, by Bramstein. He's a technical uh, guy from Typekit, Adobe Typekit. He's basically in charge for serving all the typefaces that you now, now you can use in Adobe CC and that you can use in Typekit. Uh, if you don't have a book or don't want to buy it for some reason, I don't know why, uh, you can go to his website and he has a lot of articles on how to improve from performance in various scenarios in various cases all right so that was the the main major part that i kind of wanted to had to present because that was the title but i have some bonus things just a couple of them um, so this year early this year we released bento motor that was a web specimen that actually pushed the 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 responsive typography to the limits anyone seen it no? All right. So Bento Modern webs, uh, Web Type dot com, uh, that's one HTML, two designs. So again, proving that separating uh, uh, structure from presentation is actually helpful because we have two designs. This, this is one of them, the magazine style. Um, and we used a couple of effects that are not so, uh, so uh, usual on, on the web. Uh, even though they can look you know, impressive and you can probably push them even more, again, we are using progressive enhancement. We are not polluting HTML. We are not creating any dependencies. Uh, so let's see what's happening. For instance, the complete series here, this 3D effect was accomplished by using text shadows. And because you want to uh, have different shades in horizontal direction and in vertical direction, uh, you have to specify uh, the, the shadow for you know for each direction and then you go one by one one by one and of course this looks very cool because it's handcrafted CSS handcrafted anything in the code come on uh, and I'm super lazy uh, when 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 I write CSS so that's why I use SAS and I wrote a, a function for that I mean it's not a specially clever, clever function and it's especially not very appropriate to say it's a function on a developers conference uh, but anyway, uh, you know, using, by using SAS, you can save a lot of, lot of work because now you, you, I can hand, hand that over to the designer and they can just change some values here and, you know, the depth of the shadow and, you know, decide which, which way they want to go and that's about it. The next thing, drop caps, very effective thing, especially if you're building something like a magazine website or, or a news portal or something like that. Uh, again, how to do it? You can float it to the left by why doing it because you know uh, you'll probably have to create uh, se a separate version for each browser. You can use dropcap.js by Adobe team. It's completely independent of any JavaScript libraries. So if you carefully optimize your website for performance, 
you just get the additional uh, the additional functionality at no uh, many or head. And the use is very, very simple. You just uh, decide how many lines it should span. And in this case, how high should it be? So for instance, this is five lines high and should span three lines. Very easy to use. So whenever somebody says, well, can we improve the text to look a little more attractive? You can always use drop caps because that's really uh, something that's very simple to, uh, to use. But it will add a certain style to the overall text. Then how to do this? Of course, we don't have a CSS selector that can select each particular letter. But you can, I mean, you can I either pollute HTML with spans, or you can use uh, lettering JS or, or something like that, so JavaScript to create spans in your headlines. So you can actually select that particular letter. Again, how to do that? Very cool feature, rotate. Uh, again, if you want to make additional adjustments here, always use progressive techniques. So don't use, for instance, position absolute, margin, or something like that. Because if you position it with position absolute, and then the, the browser cannot recognize this rule, it will be a way off. So if you're using uh, a transform rotate, then you can add a comma, and then use translate Z, or X, or 3D, or whatever, to reposition the letter properly. Again, progressive enhancement. This one was very cool because it actually made sense to do it like this. We had we wanted different effect, right? Again, uh, we use transform rule, and the cool thing is that there are no flip uh, functions in CSS. But you, if you scale it negatively in both directions, you'll actually get the effect of, of flipping. And again, if it doesn't work in a browser, not will happen. The, the, the type will just render properly like you would expect it. And people will know that there was supposed to be an effect there. And now I want to show you something really, really complicated. I mean, it was complicated until we figured it out. So I, I want to take a look, you to take a look at this particular design, this one, and this one. Well, yeah, it's a little pale, but there are some letters here. So anyway, how to make it responsive? How to make it, it's very easy to do it on desktop screen when you have only one resolution. But how do you make it scalable? You know, how, how do you make it work on mobile, tablet, when you resize the window, et cetera? So the first thing is to create some you know, redundant uh, HTML structure. So you need to have a container. And do you know about the viewport width units, some of you? All right, great. So viewport width units. You specify the container in viewport with units, and then you can use percentages or M's for everything that's inside. So whenever the container is squished, everything inside the container will actually get a dynamic value. So if you say something is, so for instance, this U word is 100% of a parent element, which is 100% of viewport unit, at some point, you know, when you start downsizing the browser, it will actually get dynamically the lower value. And then if you want to uh, use uh, absolute positioning to rearrange stuff around for the container, you can use this hack here. Do you know about it? It will retain the aspect ratio of a box, right? So if you specify height 0 and use a padding, then you can actually retain the aspect ratio. Did you know about that? Because you look pretty surprised. Anyway. When you use padding, the padding will always use the, the value of the width. Right? So whenever you decrease the, the width, if, if in one case the width is 1,000 pixels, which is 100%, then this will go 500 pixels in height. If you reduce the, the width, the, the padding will uh, proportionally be reduced as well. So you retain the aspect ratio. And then when you have the box that's actually scalable, you can use the same technique for, for videos, for instance, for YouTube videos. When the, when the box is scalable and retains its proportion, then you can use absolute positioning, again, with percentages or M's, because now uh, they all rely to this box here. Right? Everything will be proportional. And these are three different methods. So one is with M's. Another one is with percentages. 
and the third one is with m negative margins. So all three work in the same way. All right, so I think now you have a pretty good idea what what else we can do in, in web topography except just you know setting paragraphs and setting appropriate line height. Uh, it, it still requires a lot of manual labor, so that's why uh, type tester, the thing that we built in 2005, is now uh, actually in the second version. So we created the tool for, for rearranging layouts that also contains all the things that you can do with type, like regular stuff. And then we put it to test this June when I was in New York at the typographic conference. Um, do you know about Jeffrey Zellman? How many of you know him? The godfather of web standards? Uh, so Nick Sherman, he's also a famous typography guy from New York. He did an interview and said, well, can you do the, the full transcript and design it a little bit so that it's more attractive uh, you know, for tomorrow? And then my friend Tim, Tim Kadej that also lives in New York uh, said, well, we should probably do it. Let's just use type tester and, and let's see what, what types we can do. So we had about 12 quotes there and we wanted to you know, make them like line and you know, highlight some stuff. And so it took us about two hours in type tester to actually create all these designs, export them, and put on the web. This one is really, really great. And this one is also very nice. This was before Georgia. So things like that are actually very easy, easily made in type tester because now you just you know decide on the glyph. You use one interactive glyph, which, which is usually 9% in a, in, a, in a typeface. And then you can combine stuff like this in no time. And when you export it, you just you know, grab that HTML CSS. Everything is ready because we have this algorithm for creating uh, um, proportional uh, fixed, fixed aspect ratio boxes and positioning uh, everything inside of it, absolutely. So you can just export it, and it will work. It will scale up and down. This one took me about 10 minutes to create. Of course, I had a sketch, but you know, I just click stuff, moved it around, aligned it a little bit, and exported CSS for that. So you can go to preview.typeser.org. Uh, there's a beta sign up thing. Uh, try it or give it to your designer and see if they can use it, if that's something usable, and just let us know uh, in an email what, what's up with that. Um, one cool thing can happen when you start fiddling with it is, for instance, uh, I start with the 9% because I'm in love with this letter. Um, and then I you know, create a drop shadow to, to be just a little bit more stylish. And then you know, all kind of you know, stupid things come to your mind, like, let's put something here. You know? And then it actually makes sense. And then when you observe it, when you observe the shapes and you start enjoying typefaces, not in that way, you know, in, in normal way, professional way, uh, you start seeing things like this, right? And then, you know, in, in, in maybe just, just as an experience, you already have some design that can be actually used somewhere on some website. And then you get, you know, all kinds of different ideas, and maybe you can try and make a design that actually suits your, some other content that you have. You know, this one was just randomly uh, designed, but uh, it, it turned out so well. Um, so, by now, you're probably aware that you know, there's nothing creative about designing with typography. You know? It's all basically math. It's all basically guidelines, rules. So if you follow these rules, if you, if you go to the link uh, and download the presentation, you have everything already ready-made in CSS. You know, no no uh, reason to reinvent the wheel, no reason to suffer, to, you know, to kind of uh, bang your head against your desk because the designer wants something that you cannot you know, do. Because we can do a lot with CSS nowadays. Uh, so we learned how to reset the document, how to create the contrast, the appropriate contrast on the screen. We learned how to select the typeface. You hopefully know how to kern now. Um, I told you about the paragraphs and the proportion that we have to retain depending on the, on the line length. You know that we can use different style options like all caps, small caps, italics for small screens, and that we can use scales for large screens. Again, website uh, modulescale.com will help you with that. 
you'll learn that tabular data is just has to be aligned so that it's usable, so that people can actually read stuff. Vertical align top, align every, t every numeric value to the right so that they can compare units uh, singles by singles. Um, you learn that we can actually separate different experiences, typographic experiences, using media queries. You also learn that we can create something more elaborate, something more delicate, and then it can actually scale up and down without breaking anything. So after that, when you, when you learn all that, uh, the next step is actually go to some of these resources and play a little bit. And then, you know, in no time, you'll be able to actually create your own typographic show like this guy. He was 12 here. Um, already doing some, you know, uh, letter marks. This is actually my initials. That's my logotype for, for his dad. Um, but I'll always like to show this video of him. Because it actually uh, illustrates everything that we do. You know? First time around, we have some labyrinths, and then we don't know how to you know, solve them. But the next time around, we're you know, much more comfortable with it. Yeah, it goes much smoother. And then you increase your speed because you know you're used to it. You just try to do faster. And then you know you can take straight roads, something you know that you're not comfortable with. Sometimes you fail. But when you do, take it with a smile. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so I'm, I don't know if we have time for questions or if you want to have some questions. All right, just shout it. So, so you think that it's still about resolution? Oh, uh, all right. So the thing is, if you choose a poor serif typeface, it won't look good anywhere, right? And people won't read it. So if you choose something that's actually designed for the screen, that then it it will be read. It will it will be read. It will be readable anyway. You know, it will it will render properly, and people will want to read it. So it's more about uh, choosing the, the appropriate typeface than uh, you know, just putting typefaces in some categories. And a really good, really good foundry for this. So if you ever have this problem of, of your typeface not being readable, uh, uh, webtype.com has the best rendering typefaces. I can, you know, I can say that without preferring anyone. They really are specialized in that. So they can actually, even even the designer from Verdana in Georgia uh, works for them. So you know, these are the typefaces that are traditionally the most legible typefaces on any screen. Uh, so what would we prefer for for body typeface, sans serif or serif? Uh, again, um, it depends on the project. I mean, independence is is a universal answer for everything. Uh, but if you have something that's linear, that's 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 uh, long form text, then probably uh, serif is better. If you have a lot of scattering information, uh, for instance, if you have to compare stuff, if you, ha if you have a product listing, then it's m better to have to use some serif because people can go, you know, and read in different uh, directions. So whenever you have something that's read from top to bottom, then serif is probably you know not the best choice, but that's something that you should investigate first and see if that works. If not, then you know you can you can choose something else. But in when you have uh, we, when you have nonlinear like tables, uh, some grids, some um, you know product pages, a lot of uh, uh, disconnected pieces of information on the screen, then it's kind of first choice is sans serif, not necessarily the best choice but you know that that should be the first choice just because uh serves just uh, add this horizontal stress so it's much easier to actually follow follow the lines of text in sans serif than in serif 
uh, sorry, in surf than in sans surf because they have these little you know, details and in, in, in then visually you create a baseline uh, in the text. Alright, so the question is whether I, I personally prefer flash of unstyled text or flash of invisible text because that's the opposite thing. Uh, and the question is since we have so fast connections, so where do you live? Alright, so here's someone who lives in, in a developed country basically, right? And we also, we all probably have broken connection, nobody has I mean, the, the lowest that you can have in Europe is like uh, ADSL, especially if you're working on the web, right? So uh, if you go to, for instance, if you use the roaming plan from Deutsche Telekom, that's, that's actually Whitley Friedman's, his, his chief uh, editor at Smashing. That's his story. Uh, so whenever he uses his roaming plan and going to Moscow, visiting Vogue.com takes him about 92 euros, something like that just loading the page, <laughs> which is horrible. <laughs> so uh, the thing with performance is that we, um, it's very simply to neglect it. So what you can do is you can throttle the connection in your uh, Google Chrome browser. That's a really great thing. Uh, and you can do it even locally. And you can you choose, for instance, good 3G, and it will, you will wait a lot. You know, so whenever you're developing your website, you're usually doing it from the office or you know from home, and you usually have a stable broadband. Uh, that's you know that's not a problem. But whenever you you know imagine if you for for a week if you just develop your website using uh, tethering from your mobile phone, then you'd see the difference. Because even though we have three G connections in Croatia, we have four uh, G already, and it's pretty stable. Uh, but for instance. Um, I was very surprised in New York. In New York, every, everywhere you have 3G connection. Every, everywhere it, it reports that it's LTE, but it's so crowded that it's actually much slower than 3G, right? So sometimes your connections report as very fast, but you actually don't get the, the fast connection at all. And you, then you have all the, all the latency issues, all, all that kind of stuff. So the download might be uh, fast enough, but for instance, the number of requests is actually what's slowing your website down. So that's why, uh, I mean, and all, all, all different things can happen. For instance, if you're traveling, uh, you get the CSS and the HTML in the first request, but then your web fonts are delayed for whatever reason, because you entered the tunnel or something like that. Then you have to actually wait, because the browser uses the back in the web fonts, uh, to wait to, to get the web fonts so that they can display. So that's why I think it's always good to have the flash of unstyled text so that at least people can start reading and then they get the replacement. The problem with that is that you have to style two typefaces. And you can do that by using web font loader, which adds class if the web font is actually downloaded and active. So you can, you know, tweak the fallback font. You can choose the font, the system font that's, you know, very similar to the font that you want. Uh, and stuff like that. You can, you know. Uh, the new thing in, in CSS standard is font metrics uh, property that will allow you to match the X height so the change won't be so apparent anymore. You know, so you, you'd, ca you, you'd say, well, I want this X height to appear in both web fonts and the full web fonts so, you know, the change won't be so apparent. Because uh, now the trouble is if you fall back to something that's very different than the original font, then the, the change is actually abrupt and you see it as a blink. But if you had something that's very, very similar, then the change won't, wouldn't be such a problem. Is that an answer to your question? All right. You had a question? Yeah, so the most important thing with drop caps is to 
mm, to be positioned properly. So whichever you decide. So for instance, with drop caps, uh, example that I showed, you can even flip the, um, you can even flip the uh, background and foreground color, for instance. Where is it? Here we have one. All right, so since this is an element, I mean, you always have to have a span to, 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 to fetch, or you can use uh, pseudo, pseudo class first element, all right? Uh, but it behaves as a box because if you specify float left or this block, it will be a box. Um, so you can, you know, you can even invert colors. So I can, I can make it a red box with white a letter inside of it, whatever. But the most important thing with drop caps is that they're actually, you know, aligned in a way so that they don't just, you know, uh, they're not loosely positioned. So that's the most important thing because drop caps are anchors for the eye, right? So you want the, the, the reader to see the, the anchor and then just continue reading text, right? So that's why, that, that's probably the most important thing. Well, that's, that's a stylistic question, you know, depending on, on what, what kind of mood you want to achieve on the website, right? So sometimes, um, well, that, that's, that's the whole uh, different topic, but uh, there are actually some tests, it's called, so the website is called typetasting.com, type, type testing, and um, she's, Sarah's uh, doing a lot of experience about how people perceive certain typefaces. So for instance, he has a scale of the cheapest to the most expensive and she will give you cards and then you say, oh, this is, this is more expensive than the previous one, et cetera, et cetera. So she has a lot of stats there. And uh, that's basically what you want to, you know, how, what you want to communicate. So if you want to communicate so something that's fast, how do you do that? Do you have an idea? Something that's fast and dynamic. You just use italics because that, you know, kind of creates the movement, you know. Um, so that kind of stuff. And if you just use, uh, if you use a serif, then it, you know, in general, it brings authority compared to sans serif. But sans serif is more, you know, modern. It's more, you know, fresh. You can do a lot of stuff with it. So if you if you uh, make this italic, it will it will look more sophisticated than this. But if you use italic with with sans serif, it will look more dynamic, right? So it all depends of what kind of mood you want to accomplish uh, on the website. All right. All right, perfect. Thank you all for coming and have a nice rest of the day.